Okay, as part of the discussion of the video signal and video technology, it's important that we understand how the video signal is measured and how we can use various tools uh, to understand what's happening with video and why it works and why it doesn't work. And so we're going to talk today about the device called the waveform monitor. Now the waveform monitor uh, is a machine that has gone through a number of different changes throughout the years. And first of all, why do we care about this? Why do we care about this thing we call the waveform monitor or the waveform in, in general? And the reason is because everything is subjective in terms of the artistic world and uh, the spur of the moment sort of thing. If you were to witness an accident and five other people were there, each of them would see the accident five different ways. In fact, uh, the car may have five different colors, and that's part of the problem here. Uh, TV monitors are all different even today. Now, they used to be a lot worse. Uh, as we said, NTSC was sometimes called never the same color. So um, well, the way you know that is that the old TV monitors used to have a hue control where, and then, you know, when you were a kid, you do this, or when you were a kid growing up in the 70s and 80s, you open up the little panel in front of the TV and start turning the dobs, and then your parents throw a fit when they see because the faces are all purple and stuff like that. Well, one of those knobs was the hue control, which basically throws everything out of calibration. And so uh, you never know if that's exactly right. And that's the way television monitors work. And even today, they're still not perfect. Uh, sometimes it's hard to judge what we see. Sometimes the lighting in the room affects how the monitor works. Uh, sometimes uh, you can spend a fortune on a very good monitor, and it still isn't exactly right. Uh, the human eye doesn't always agree either. Uh, some people are colorblind. Some people uh, tend to favor different colors over others. And so uh, you really need an objective view. And uh, that's why the waveform monitor is important. Because the signal is very precise and it can be precisely measured. Measurements don't lie. If you're not sure if you're overexposed, see what the scope says. You know, is it, is it overexposed or not? Well, if the scope says it isn't, it isn't. If the scope says it is, it doesn't matter what you see. And that doesn't mean you can't misread or misinterpret the monitor, but at least you've got it. Okay, and even the, even the digital world has not erased this. In fact, I'm, I was delighted to find out that we still have waveform monitors uh, built into every camera that we buy, and they're also built into the software, which we'll demonstrate also. Okay, now these are, or this is a waveform monitor. If you look on the left here, uh, this is what it actually looked like. Uh, so if you were to um, uh, go on a video shoot, so let's say back uh, before the year 2000, you might actually carry one of these with you on the field. They were heavy, these heavy instruments. And so it's like carrying uh, two or three monitors because along with a waveform monitor, you also get a vector scope, which is essentially the same thing. We'll talk about how they differ later in the lecture today. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you will see uh, this is what you would be measuring. Uh, this is the video signal. Now, this is the big video signal representing bars, which we'll talk about also. Okay, so the waveform monitors used to be separate devices that would not be included in, uh, in the, the pack. They wouldn't be part of your field monitor. They wouldn't be part of your, um, your camera display. But they're absolutely essential for diagnosing video. Uh, they're particularly necessarily in judging exposure and contrast. And in the days of analog, they used to be the only way you could find out why the video signal wasn't working. And this would get into things like uh, whether or not the, uh, the color burst was, was correct. If the color wasn't working, there was something wrong with the way the color burst generator was working. And so you may have to take the, the camera apart and then put a little tiny screwdriver in there and tweak certain things. It literally came down to that. Fortunately, that almost never happens these days. Uh, much of this is still in use today, although they no longer give you some of the uh, calibration equipment they used to because uh, it's all for analog and we don't have to worry about it anymore. Okay, so here uh, is what the average display would look like. Now, the one on the left here, uh, you can still see the lines and the measurements. Uh, and you can see that this, uh, this is a video signal of something. Uh, and way up here, this top area, this uh, green blob here, 
is is in and around the top of the scale, which would be the 100 mark. 100 is as bright as video is allowed to get. And down here, you'll notice something interesting. This big, thick green line is at zero. And there's like a little crosshatch park there where you line that up with. That's zero. Now, interestingly enough, that is not black. Black is up this up here. Just this little line up here is what we call TV black, which we'll talk about. And so if for some reason you have video information like this down below this line, that is an immediate red flag that something terrible has happened. And also, if you've got video going way up high, uh, it will begin to clip off and we'll see that that's not a good thing either. Uh, or if your video level tops out at around here, you're probably underexposed. Uh, some of these other things, uh, this, uh, this is what we call the sync tip. Uh, which is down here at minus 40, and that's what you just have to make sure that, that this ratio was correct uh, back in the old days. This is the color burst. This is where color information is governed. And over here, we have an enlargement, which used to be something you could set up on the, on the scope. You could literally count the number of waves in the sink tip, and I think they called this the front porch, and that was the back porch, uh, and uh, you don't have to know what that is anymore. And some of these other things might be uh, closed circuiting or, or closed captioning rather, or other things that may occur inside the video signal. So the graticule is the name of the screen. The entire screen is called a graticule. I don't know what that, or I don't know why it's called that, but it is. And so if you want to really impress somebody, use that term. You can sound really smart. Now, the, uh, the video signal is measured in units called IREs. And so, if you want to say how uh, bright the video signal is, you say it's peaking out at around 80 IREs, or it's, uh, it's, uh, it's close to 100 IREs. Again, if you want to sound smart, if you just say it's close to 100, that works as well. Uh, but why not flaunt your knowledge? Uh, IRE stands for Instituted Radio Engineers, which you don't have to know either. Uh, maximum white versus maximum black. Uh, as we said before, uh, video maxes out at 100. You really shouldn't have video going above 100, although in practice you usually do. Maybe by a little bit, but not by much. Now, uh, you can now have video going down to zero. It used to be that that was a completely illegal thing to do. Uh, and that, uh, that sync uh, line, at uh, the zero line, you were never supposed to touch that. Uh, but since we've gone digital, now in high definition, we've sort of merged with the way Europe is doing things, and now you actually can have a video level that approaches the zero line, just not below it. So that's something to understand. So maximum black would be the zero line. TV black uh, would be the 7.5 IRE line. And so uh, by habit, I still use TV black because even though TV black is really kind of a very dark gray, uh, it's, um, it's something that you can guarantee that your audience is going to be able to see. If you go below 7.5, things start to disappear. It's hard to distinguish black uh, from the TV in the off position. And so uh, that's something to, to bear in mind. The color burst, as we said, contains the color information. Uh, I've been in this business a very long time. I've never really had to explore that any more detail than that. It's just something to know. Uh, the sync tip. That just has to line up on the bottom. Now, if there's something wrong with the sync tip, uh, then that just means there's something really wrong with the whole video signal, and you'd probably want to find out what it is. Uh, fortunately, that no longer happens in, in the digital world. Active video is an important thing to know. That is anything that appears between zero IREs and 100 IREs in the main part of the graticule. So, therefore, uh, if you don't see anything at all between, uh, if you don't see anything at all above zero, uh, that means you're either looking at a black picture or something's disconnected. Uh, if you see active video uh, all over the place going higher than 100, then maybe you're, too, you're overexposed. But active video would mean that something is going on. And the vector scope uh, is, a, is the same thing as a waveform monitor, but it measures only color information. The waveform monitor can include color information, 
but it's really more intended to measure uh, brightness and contrast. The vector scope separately measures color. Now here is an example of what you might see in a regular shoot. Uh, this uh, main window up here is showing you color bars, which is a test pattern signal. And if you just see color bars, uh, know that the very first color on the list would normally be yellow. If it looks yellow, you're probably all right. Uh, and then the other colors don't really much matter. These two, some, between purple and red, can sometimes be important. But this is color bars, and you have two whites. This is your 80% white. This is your 100% white. Now, if you look at the waveform monitor display, you will see that each of these color bars is represented by an intensity level, kind of like a stair step. Now, the very top one lands at 100 IREs exactly. And there should be a drop between that one and the 80% bar, and then they go down from there. Now, really, uh, if you were using this, you would be setting this up so that 100% that is set up for white. And then you would look down here, and you should see a hazy line where the black would be above the zero line, and that's your TV black. Now, if you look over at the vector scope, you will see this star pattern in which all of the colors line up in these little checkered boxes they're supposed to be. That will be red. This will be magenta. That's blue. That's cyan. That's green. And that's yellow. And then you have your, I think this is a, a tip, you know, the sink tip or something like that. They, they change the name of this from time to time. But this is lined up with that line, that little thin one. They line up with that line. And that's basically how it would look if you were doing this in an analog fashion. Okay, so here we are in an actual video editing situation. And you're going to see uh, what has happened uh, to these wonderful uh, waveform and vector scopes. Now, they have been reduced in size from these big clunky machines to these two little bitty screens that you see uh, on your editing window. Now, the editing stations that we have set up for you Always include those uh, in, the, in the basic setup, which we'll talk about later on. Now here, you'll notice this is a, a vector, oh, this is the waveform monitor, and you should notice that it does not contain the color burst and the sync tip because they've essentially um, figured you don't really need that information at a glance. Uh, so you, you've got your zero line here, and you've got your 100 line, and the vector scope remains basically the same. And so what I'm going to demonstrate here is how you would go about diagnosing a piece of video. So I'm going to move this video ahead a little bit, and you can see we've got some drone footage here. So if I play this real time, uh, you should see this is the video signal. Now, this is your waveform monitor. Now, you look, you see that big bright area around the 100 mark? That's probably the sky. And uh, if you'll notice... This is coming in, uh, this little green area here is probably the grass, and uh, it looks like that cyan mark is, is this area here. Now, I would say that this footage is reasonable, but let me go ahead and look at it again. So, if I'm diagnosing it, uh, first of all, how could you change it? Well, I'll show you. If you've already shot it, you can always edit it. So, I'm going to highlight the clip. And I'm going to go to my effects window, which is down here. And I'm going to go to video effects. And I'm going to find color correction. And I'm just going to go to brightness and contrast. I'm going to drop that into here. So that gives me control over brightness and contrast. So I'm going to open those sliders up so you can see them. Now look what happens if I move the brightness. Notice what happens to the whole video signal. The window gets darker, and the waveform monitor drops. The whole thing drops up and down. Now, the moment I do that, look what happens to the black information. It goes through the floor. So that can't be the only thing that you adjust. Now, on the other hand, if I go to my contrast, I shrink the entire system. And what that does is it removes blacks and whites and leaves you with kind of a gray. So obviously you don't want to shrink it too far, 
And if you go the other way, then you lose anything that's remotely neutral. And so everything becomes stark, light and dark. So if I wanted to set this signal up to make sure that I had full control over it, I would park what I thought was the, uh, the TV black area right there. You get some, some blacks can go a little bit below there, but nothing's going below zero. And right now my whites are around 80%. I can, I can goose that a little bit more and just frame it in the shot. So there I would have something that is approaching you know, a very respectable signal. And there I'm not even hitting 100. Now you don't have to hit 100. The sky would hit 100. But if you're looking there, maybe not so much. So if I move this ahead a little bit, I can see the white roofs there are peaking around 80%. That's the brightest thing you're going to see there. Now there we may have gone down a little bit. So you just go ahead and move the brightness up. So I would say, and if I turn this off, I would still say that that signal is useful because it isn't really peaking over 100. We've just put the white roofs on the trustees building at the 100% line. And I would say not to change that unless you had to. Now I've got some other footage here to show you. And this is something that was, uh, that was shot uh, last year. I think. So if I go here, let's play some of this. So this is, you'll notice we got a little bit of a warning sign here. There's a big, big white line. Uh, that is the sky. Now that's not necessarily a deal breaker only because it is the sky, but let's see what we could do with that. If I drag brightness and contrast down here uh, to get a look at it, I'm just going to open up brightness and contrast once again. If I begin to bring it down, notice, look, look what's happening. We're getting information that we couldn't see before. That means it was overexposed. You see, that's the sky, but that's where it was originally. So if I put the sky down there, and right now that's all I'm going to do. You can see where the sky is. It's just below 100. If I tell it to ignore my corrections, see what happens? Everything goes way the heck up and information is literally clipped off the signal. It's lost. Once it gets into that thick line, it never comes back. And so therefore, uh, you want to be able to, uh, to fix that. So, so there we are. And so from there, I can see that my blacks are still in the right place. We're not, we're not uh, in fact, there's nothing really dark enough there to go down to zero. So that's basically all right. And there, yeah, even then, it's still not completely overexposed. But you can see where the signal lands. And if you're looking at the, uh, the vector, you can see we have a wide range of colors here. Probably got some magenta there, some green, different shades of green, and a few others. Okay, so let's say we move this over to this shot here. And let's see. Here, we got a different problem altogether. Now, notice... If we're just looking at this shot, everything is around the 40% mark, maybe 50%. And uh, except for the lights, the lights are way the heck up here. Uh, this is not really an acceptable video signal. So if we play some of this, you can see that uh, we got we got a mask man there. I fit in really well this semester. But essentially, everything is dark. Uh, notice here we have a situation where we have black information that's just hovering below zero. I would argue that that's probably a safe signal. But I'm going to move my brightness and contrast in here a little bit to get a better look at it. So then if I open up, let's click on this. If I open up my brightness and contrast sliders so I can better look at them. If I were to raise the level... You see, we're not really gaining or losing anything, but we are getting, we, we, we definitely want more out of this because the, we're really not losing the lights if we overexpose them more. But if I take my contrast up, notice what a difference that makes. Here, I'm taking the information that's there and spreading it out a bit. So I can literally create more information than was there before. 
Now, when I do that, you notice we get a little bit of problem with color because the colors become a little, uh, a little intense. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down here to, uh, to uh, Q saturation and level. I'm going to just drop that in there, HLS. And if I go down and find out where that is, I'm only really interested in saturation. So if I take down my saturation, see what the vector scope is doing. The colors are getting closer to the center, and basically we're going to black and white. So you don't necessarily, if we goose it, then it just makes a mess. But you can just bring that in a little bit so that the colors don't get overwhelming. And that's basically how you would do this. So there you are. That's basically what you have to understand about uh, the, the waveform monitor and vector scope. The diagnostic tools, and it's important to understand that you can manipulate what the video signal is doing, and you know how you can do it safely if you can see that it's still within safe limits. If you just play around with the controls and see what happens, uh, you could be creating video that's going to have other problems that turn up later. And so, in any case, this is the, an introduction to that process.